Welcome everyone to the Girlfriend Book Club's monthly discussion. I'm Shelly Emling, the editor of the Girlfriend Newsletter. I'm also the moderator of the Girlfriend uh, Book Club on Facebook. And I just want to thank all of you for joining. And I have to give a shout out. We're up to nearly 41,000 members in the Girlfriend Book Club. And I just appreciate you all so much. Um, it's a great group of women and we love all things literary. And it's been so much fun moderating this book club. So for our April book club pick, you all, the 41,000 members, chose The Maid. I had nothing to do with it. You guys chose it. You voted on it. I read it in a weekend, so I'm so pleased that you picked it because it was one of the best reads I've uh, enjoyed in a very long time. So thanks very much for choosing The Maid for April. And so tonight, I'm so, so pleased that we have the author, Nita Prose, joining us for our discussion. This is her debut novel, and um, I, I'm just thrilled that she's here. So welcome, Nita. Hello, Shelly, and hello, all you girlfriends out there. I feel like I already know you, and I'm so, so uh, proud to be here tonight. So thank you. We're so proud, pleased to have you here. So for, for the maybe four or five people that don't know what The Maid is about uh, and Molly, can you just give like a quick summary of what this great book is, is, is about? Sure. Well, The Maid features Molly, who is a socially awkward hotel room maid whose world gets turned upside down when she st suddenly stumbles across a, a guest who's very dead in his hotel room bed. Um, you know, this is a book about what it means to be the same as everyone else and yet entirely different. And I think as, as a murder mystery, as a whodunit, it's also a little bit different too because the mystery can only be solved through connection to the human heart. So I heard that you came up with this idea, uh, I believe it was in 2019 in London. Is that right? Yes. So, so what made you think of doing a, a book, a thriller, a mystery, that the center character, the central character was a maid in a hotel? Well, I didn't actually plan to write a debut novel. I know there are lots of writers out there who just sit down and decide, yeah, this is what I'm going to do now. That was not me. Um, you know, I'm an editor and I work in the book publishing industry. And once a year, we travel to London where all of us meet all together and we talk about books and we talk about acquisitions and we get all the hot tips on the latest things. So that's why I was in London. And um, I was staying at a London area hotel and I and I walked out of my hotel to go to a meeting nearby. And when I came back a little bit while a little while later, I completely startled the roommate who was cleaning it. And I remember her sort of like jumping back into a shadowy corner. And I looked at her and she looked at me. And the extraordinarily embarrassing part is that in her hands, this, I regret this terribly. She had my track pants, which I had left in a tangled mess on my bed in my rush to go make my meeting. And, you know, it occurred to me as I looked at her, what an intimate and invisible job it is to be a roommate. You know, by cleaning my room every day, she knew so much about me, but I did not know a thing about her. And you know, Shelly, it was just one of those little things that kind of lodges in the back of your brain right. somewhere. I didn't think about it anymore. I went on with my day. In fact, I went on with several days. And then, you know, a few days later, I was on my plane ride home. And that's when it came to me. And it was Molly's voice. It was very clean and precise. It, she talked like <laughs> Molly and I could hear her just like this, you know, a little different from the yeah. way I sound. <laughs> and, um... I didn't have any paper with me, so I grabbed the napkin from under my drink and I started to write the prologue to the maid in a single burst. And I'm telling you, that is when my debut novel began. That's amazing. So since then, I'm just curious. So you didn't actually befriend that maid that you bumped into, right? I've never seen her again. <laughs> so, so, I mean, since then, though, have you befriended the, the maids that you have encountered at your the various hotels you've stayed at? Well, I would say not, not in that Giselle way, which maybe <laughs> crosses a few more boundaries that I'd be comfortable with. But yes, for sure, I am highly aware of, you know, the very difficult job it is to be a roommate, to exist invisibly in plain sight. And yet do us that great service uh, that we all feel when we're in a nice hotel. 
which right. is everything is just polished to perfection, as Molly would say. Yeah. And we don't have to think about anything right. to do right. with our own cleanliness or with sanitation or anything else. And gosh, in these days with a certain virus in our midst, that's especially uh, right. important. And um, the maid is an incredibly valuable figure <laughs> in our lives. So tell us a little bit about your background. I mean, I know your background is in publishing, but tell the audience a little bit about your background. I am a, a, a long suffering editor, um, but I say that facetiously because I actually love my job. So um, I've worked in publishing for about 20 years and I honestly credit um, you know, my knowledge of how to write a debut novel to my authors who've taught me just about everything I needed to know in order to pen this debut. Huh, okay. Are you, um, so I, yeah, so I wanted to ask, are you surprised? So this is your debut novel. You've been in publishing all these years. When you wrote this, did you think it was going to get the reception that, it, it, that it's gotten? Because it's, you know, every, you know, the book club, even the girlfriend book club, everybody's talking about this book, The Maid. I mean, did you, are you surprised or did you think it was going to make oh. such a smash? I am completely and uh, totally surprised. To this day, I wake up pinching myself and I, you know, I have to wake up and go, oh yeah, that's real. That is not a dream. Um, you know, despite the fact that, or because of the fact that I'm in this industry, I know the odds. Yeah. I know how difficult it is to actually break through with a story that reaches a mass audience. And I think because I know that, I am so tremendously grateful for the readers who take the time to invest in this story, which is a little bit unusual because, you know, uh, a murder mystery with heart. Well, those two things don't very commonly go together. <laughs> and so I'm incredibly grateful for those readers who give it a try. And, you know, I hope if I've done my job right, that as you get into the book a little bit more, um, you come to, you know, live as Molly the maid and also come to love her. So what about your family and friends? Are they stunned by this? Did they read it and, and uh, did they edit it at all or look, look at it or, I mean, I'm they didn't, curious. they didn't edit it. I would not trust them to do such a thing. <laughs> <laughs> Love you fam, but no, um, but they did read early drafts, you know, right. and I think, um, you know, it was very nice to have the, the support of my family, of course. Um, but something even more meaningful was to then send out my work to the publishing world and have their support. Because honestly, Shelley, I did not expect this, as I said. And, you know, when I was writing, I wrote in secrecy. I wrote in absolute secrecy. I didn't tell my colleagues with whom I work every day in publishing. I didn't tell my partner. I did not tell my family because I had a sort of extra cargo, an extra burden on my shoulders, which was that, you know, if I was rejected, if my work didn't live up to a certain benchmark, well, I would still have to go to work every day and face everybody in publishing who would know that I was a failure. And this was, you know, a burden to me at the beginning. So I decided to work alone, absolutely and totally alone. And in some ways, now that I think about that, you know, um, Molly is in a similar situation for different reasons. She's very alone at the beginning of the book. She's lost her grandmother who navigates her way in everything, who helps her in so many formative, important ways. And she goes through that journey alone. And in my own little way, in my own tiny way, I guess I did the same thing with this book. Well, well the grandmother was a great character, although, you know, um, she's she's not alive during the book. She's, she's always, uh, Molly's always reflecting on her conversations with her grandmother. So was she based on anyone? Or did you know from the beginning that you were gonna have Molly and the grandmother, uh, the, the relationship there from the beginning or no? I did. I knew that at some level this was, you know, beyond it being a murder mystery, was also a book deeply about grief. And um, so so I knew that there was a voice that 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 matriarchal older voice that would would serve as a chorus for Molly and as a compass in her life. And as for what inspired me, you know, I. I have to say I wasn't entirely conscious of this while I was writing uh, the book, but it became pretty clear afterwards that in so many ways, Gran is my mother. You know, I lost my mother a few years ago um, and she, I was so lucky to have her. She was just this stalwart, incredible matriarch who lived um, life by doing 
and never ever stopped to think what she was doing when she did things. And that sort of willfulness and that sort of, um, I don't know, mentor in my midst was so incredibly important to me. And in some ways, I wanted to give the reader the gift of that matriarch, whether, you know, the readers out there have had such a wonderful woman figure in their lives before, a grandmother, a mother, or somebody else, or whether they haven't. We all need a grand. Right. So a lot of the um, book club members today messaged me and said to ask you about the main character, Molly. Um, was it, I mean, how did you come up with her quirkiness? Did you, did you base her on somebody that you knew or did it kind of unfold as you were writing the chapters or, you know, she was such a unique character and she grew stronger. It seemed to me anyway, as the book went on. Um, so I, I just wondered, is it, do you have a friend that you thought about? <laughs> I, mean, I just wondered where she came from. And so do a lot of the book club members. Sure. I think that's an entirely fair question. And, and Molly sort of appeared to me and, you know, some, you, some writers don't write consciously and, and I'm certainly um, of that ilk in some respects. I'm, I'm a very conscious writer when it comes to structure, but right. when it comes to character, you know, as Molly says, people are a mystery that can never be solved. And I, I approach character that way. It's a process of discovery. And certainly it was when I when I found and honed Molly's voice. You know, there I had a very important experience before I was an editor. I worked as a teacher for special needs students. Oh, and I didn't know that. I didn't yeah. Know that. So during that time, it was one of those experiences where I went in, in in one role as a teacher and I came out so very much in the opposite role. Mm -hmm. I was the student in some fundamental ways. Um, something that I will never forget is when I would take my students on field trips and, you know, we would have learning plans and all sorts. We would know so much about the students in the classroom. Um, they would have labels and all sorts of, um, you know, diagnoses. And those were very helpful to us as educators because it would help us individualize their learning to certain needs. But we, when we took the students out in the world, I was always just shocked by the casual cruelty of some strangers. Mm -hmm. right. um, and I will never forget that. It was a very painful realization. However, it came with a silver lining. And the silver lining was watching these kids react to that, reacting with grace and resilience and strength um, and so much dignity that so-called normative people may not always show. Um, and I have never, ever forgotten that lesson. And some of those qualities, which were among the best, brightest, most wonderful qualities in my students, I think I sort of unconsciously gave them to Molly. Well, people are commenting saying, uh, I think Molly's quirkiness made the book for me. <laughs> so, Thank you. <laughs> so so, what's, so what, did you write a, 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 some people are asking this, did you write a, an outline first or did you just plunge into the pro prologue on that, the napkins and go from there? Or did you kind of have the whole thing kind of plotted out in your head before you you wrote it. I mean, yeah, what's the I think, process like? Yeah, the prologue was a gift from the gods. That was the, 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 you know, that lightning bolt of inspiration. And, you know, that lightning bolt is great, but it doesn't last forever. And after mm -hmm. that, then the craft has to take over. Right. Um, I consider myself what I call a tent pole writer. And what I mean by that is, you know, I'm trying to construct some sort of shelter and I don't have all the walls and the roof intact, but I do have a couple of tent poles up at the beginning of the process. Right. And for me, those came in the form of twists. I knew that, you know, I'm not going to have any spoilers just in case there's the odd girlfriend out there who has not read to the end. But, um, you know, I did know a few of the bigger twists in the yeah. book and those were very motivating to me mm. because while I knew that, you know, those scenes, I could see them, I could hear them in my mind. I could actually play them. Yeah. I didn't know how I was going to get there. So it's that sense of knowing and unknown, which for me was so fertile. It was something that kept me getting up very early in the morning before my day job in order to write and sort of solve the problem so that I would eventually earn my way to the privilege of writing those scenes that I already knew I had in my mind. Well, that's what I was going to also ask you. I mean, what was your writing process like did you and you just answered I guess you you got up early every day and wrote for an hour or so I would imagine before going to your main job yes. 
a couple of hours minimum. So, um, and I still do that to this day. I wake up at 5 a.m. I work for two to three hours before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really glamorous, this writing thing. Like it's just gorgeous. Um, so I do that before I begin my day job of helping other writers from nine to five. And of course, you know, writing is a deep commitment. Um, and you know, I often will go back and edit at night and every weekend I am scrolling myself away in my office to get a little bit more done too. So um, some people have asked the, the, the Mr. Black character, which we all know dies. I mean, that's pretty early on in the, in the book. I mean, was, it, was that a difficult character to develop or write about? Or was there anything, I guess in general with the whole book, was there any scene or relationship that was more difficult to write about than the others? Um, Mr. Black was really easy because I hated him and I wanted him dead. And, you know, he represents so much um, masculine uh, villainy. Yeah. Um, so it was actually a joy to kill him off right from the get go. <laughs> I'm a very nice person, as you can see. Um, so there was there was a there was a justice to that, a poetic justice. And, and I certainly relished it um, right. in, in, you know, in a similar way to the way that Molly relishes certain elements of justice in the book. Um, in terms of writing and difficulties, I would say that uh, it wasn't so much um, difficulty as, you know, that, that characters would move on me. They would change and shift and right. evolve and metamorphize into to, to beings I didn't quite know. At the beginning, I must say, I judged Giselle very harshly. Yeah. You know, I went in thinking she was one thing and she wrote her way into being another thing entirely. Mm -hmm. I really thought she was going to be a cardboard cutout trophy wife who was right. beyond redemption. And in fact, um, as the world evolved and as the story evolved, I began to realize that one of the conceits I was sort of challenging about the classic mystery is the very archetypes of that mm -hmm. world. You know, we have the trophy socialist, we have the rich man, we have the maid, we have the doorman, we have all of these archetypes, which are just sort of carbon cutouts, uh, cardboard cutouts. And yet, you know, as I worked through the world in these, in these arcs of growth, right. what I wanted to do was invest them and make them real characters with real journeys, real hearts, and real pursuits. And in some ways that surprised me. Right. So I know, so the, uh, the Regency, Regency Grand Hotel, where this takes place, I mean, is this based on a hotel that you actually stayed at? Because I think now all of us that have read this book, you know, when the next time we go into a hotel, I mean, not that we all stay in fancy hotels or anything, but you're going to look at the doorman, perhaps the maid, the, the waiter, the person behind the reception desk in a little bit of a different light. Like there's all this stuff going on at a hotel that you may not know just from looking at it from the outside, you know? It's I think that's absolutely true. And hotels are such a fascinating place. I find them really fascinating. Right. Um, and that's because they are two-faced by definition. Um, you know, there is the facade that's reserved for the guest that's right. maintained that elegance, that, that um, mm -hmm. poshness that a five-star hotel will have. Um, yeah. And when we walk through those gleaming golden doors, but in fact, there's so much propping up that illusion. And so often the service workers are right. the ones making that illusion for the luxury of the guest. Right. You know? And as for me, I don't really stay in five-star hotels. I'm the kind of person who might walk in the lobby or go for a drink at the bar as a voyeur, but I'm afraid uh, my wallet doesn't extend to staying in very many of them. Um, that being said, I must admit to being wholly and completely fascinated by the world of all kinds of hotels, be they one star or five. Yeah. And in terms of, you know, the, this hotel and is it a real hotel? It is a pastiche. For me, it's a, it's a blend and a mix of hotels that I've visited. Um, you know, the best and the worst of them, um, in terms of that gorgeous facade that I'm talking about. And also some of those dirty secrets that go on right. behind closed doors. Well, so a few people are saying, um, I honestly never thought about leaving the maid a tip, a healthy, a healthy tip, but now I will after reading your book. Oh, and she will appreciate it. 
So I just have to ask, um, uh, well, you talked about Giselle and I mean, I love the friendship that developed between the two of them. Um, and you just said that you didn't think it would turn out that way, but I think that was kind of a favorite relationship amongst the, the people that read the book that they really appreciated Giselle, what she went through, you know, and, and connecting with a maid in that way. It was, it was really yeah. special to me when Giselle was doing the makeup, her makeup and just everything. I mean, I think that was probably one of the most, you know, delicious, wonderful parts of the, of the book for me. Well, I'm, I'm really glad to hear that, you know, because it, it was one that took me by surprise. And I think, you know, what I discovered, um, as I move through the book is sort of the concentric circles of invisibility that these female right. characters um, are grappling with in their very different ways. You know, Molly is invisible in plain sight when she works in the hotel. She's the mm -hmm. maid. She is, you know, um, not somebody anyone wants to think about too hard or never the let or, or touch because of her proximity to dirt. Um, and, but on the other hand, when, when we look at Giselle, she's this, public uh, figure who is always in the in the magazines and is always on the front pages, this glitzy glamour girl. And yet her true self is always invisible. And the only right. one who ever gets to see it during the course of the book is yeah. Molly. Right. So somebody just said, I pictured the hotel from Pretty Woman, the movie, as I was <laughs> reading it. <laughs> oh, that's, see, this is perfect. But this is exactly what I'd hope for, is that, you know, um, you know, I as a writer want to give you just enough detail so that you can then fill in the blanks of the hotel with your own imaginations, with, with your own experiences of seeing or being in hotels. Right. And so that's perfect to me that, that, that this you know, reader had that exact experience of filling in the blanks with her own experience of a movie. So I just have to ask, because I know it's true that this, the maid is being made into a movie with, um, is it Florence Pugh, is that right, Florence? That's correct. Yeah who played Amy in Little Women, which is one of my daughter's favorite movies, uh, the most recent version of Little Women. So how does that feel to, I mean, people are asking, and I would love to know, <laughs> how does that feel, your your first book, your debut novel, and now they're making it into a movie with this famous actress? It, you know, it feels all right. <laughs> feels pretty good, okay. <laughs> it's beyond my wildest imaginings um, that Universal would, pictures would pick this up and that Florence Pugh would be, you know, moved by, by Molly, moved enough that she wanted to star in the picture. So I am tremendously excited about that. Uh, things are moving along. I can't say too much about that. But, you know, when I get this Cheshire cat smile every time <laughs> that I talk about the film, it's because I'm hiding things. Um, but let so me don't just ask say, any more about the film. Well, no, you can, but I'll just be cagey and strange. Um, you know, for me, one of the most exciting parts beyond just watching Florence Pugh and the other actors perform those roles and bring them to life in ways that I think are going to be wonderful um, is actually seeing that hotel. Right. You know, as I mentioned, uh, you know, as a writer, I'm giving you the faintest details. I'm just giving you a little bit of outline of, of what that hotel was like so yeah. that you can fill in the blanks. But of course, the moving picture is a totally different experience. And so yeah. for the fun for me, and I hope the fun for um, you know all the viewers, will be getting to see the glorious detail of that hotel right. in full Technicolor. And yeah. I cannot wait for that. That'll be brilliant, yeah. Oh yeah. So a lot of people are asking, um, is there a sequel to The Maid? Will we, will we see Molly again in a future novel from you? This is a wonderful question. And my answer is, I really, really hope so. Um, the question I is- that, I think your fans want to see her again too. <laughs> I think they do. I, it's not the first time I've heard that reaction. Um, you know, I, my job is to leave the reader wanting more and for the reader to, to, to feel a real kindred uh, love for Molly by the end of the book. And I'm, and I'm always happy when, when you know, some readers say that that's exactly how they feel. Of course, the challenge for me as her creator is how to give readers more without giving them less the right. second time. So I am very much engaged in that challenge as we speak. And um, I'm very hopeful that I'll be able to uh, figure out the puzzle and deliver more of Molly in the future. 
And some are saying, when, when will the movie come out? Maybe you can't say, but I'm-, I'm I don't know. No, I can honestly say I do not know. Um, these things take time and we're certainly in the process, but there is so, so many things that have to be sorted out before we can figure out timing. <laughs> so so I'd like to know, because um, we only have five minutes left, what what authors inspire you? What what do you read? What what have been some of your like favorite books in the past? Couple I years? read all over the place. First of all, yeah. I am an omnivore and I will read anything. If you put the cereal box in front of me, I would read every word on it in two languages in Canada. Um, but, you know, I have a special place in my heart for thrillers um and i do love a good mystery as well um ashley o drains the push in, which came out in 2021 i believe is a book that i thought was just shockingly well done a book about mothers and daughters and what happens when right. that very um instinctive bond doesn't go the way we think it should that's been a favorite of the book club members yes <laughs> okay well that's good to know uh, so she is she's just a, a writer who completely astonishes me yeah. um you know she's just brilliant in every possible way so i i constantly recommend um for other people to read her because she's so brilliant so i just have to ask so the girlfriend is all about um female friendship and how important friends are as we especially as we grow older um are I mean, what do you like to do when you're not writing and reading? Obviously, you read a lot. But if you just have a night out with your girlfriends or friends, I mean, what do, what do you most like to do? Now, I know this is going to be really shocking, but I like to drink a lot of wine and <laughs> laugh a lot. I Sometimes... think every girlfriend reader likes to drink a lot of wine. <laughs> I have a feeling there might be a few people out there who know what I'm talking about. You yeah. know that wonderful feeling when you're in a room full of women and you know there is no judgment and you can really let your hair down and you've had a glass of wine and you're cackling like you're all witches <laughs> um that's that is one of my very happy places and um bless bless women and the, that wonderful sense of um matriarchal fraternity that comes in those moments when we when we can really um trust each other to have right. fun so are you binge watching anything on TV? I just have to ask because I'm trying to find a new I, series. So I tell am. Me. Okay, I am. Um, now, I, this is kind of bad because I'm going to be recommending one of my own authors, one of the authors that I edit, okay. Sarah Vaughn, Anatomy of a Scandal, which has oh, just come on Netflix. Right. Okay, yeah. so oh girlfriends, do yourself a favor. And before you turn to um, watch it, read the book. Because I'm telling you, it is just the most scintillating, page turning, to throw it across the room. I can't believe it sort of thriller. It um, looks so good. It yeah. is absolutely stellar. And she's such an incisive writer. And she writes um, so poignantly about um, the female and male experiences of assault. Um, so yeah. there's, you know, some triggers there too, just to be aware of. Um, but it's it's an incredible read, and the series is absolutely stellar. I'm in the middle of it now, and I cannot stop <laughs> thinking of it, and I'm certain that after this, I'm going to be going right back to it. <laughs> and so before we go, I have just a personal question. So you mentioned the Olive Garden restaurant in yes. the book. <laughs> yes. uh, you're in Canada. I don't know. Yes. Do you have Olive Garden in Canada? I, I mean... We do. We do. They're not as ubiquitous as they are in the U.S. Um, but, but you know, it's kind of, you know, in a book, when you're all by yourself and nobody knows you're writing it, you have to amuse yourself somehow, Shelley. <laughs> and, um, you know, uh, while I really like the Olive Garden, it's maybe not my first choice of restaurants. <laughs> However, I have this girlfriend, okay? I have this girlfriend who is so crazy passionate about the Olive Garden that all you have to do is mention the salad or the breadsticks yeah. and she will go on for 10 minutes about her passionate love for the Olive Garden. And so that is my funny little nod to her, um, including it in this book. I thought that was hysterical that Molly always wanted to go to the Olive Garden. She loves it. <laughs> for unlimited breadsticks or whatever it was. It was yes. so funny. So anyway, thank you so much for joining us tonight, Nita. It was such a pleasure to meet you. Um, Everybody, I think everybody's got this, but tell your friends to get the maid if they haven't read it. Um, such an excellent read, as I told 
Nita earlier. I read it in one weekend and I couldn't put it down once I started. So I'm, I'm so thrilled to meet you and best of luck with the movie. We can't wait till it comes out. Um, and for all of you Girlfriend Book Club members, please stay on the book club page because I'm going to be posting about six conversation starters so you can talk about the book uh, amongst yourselves. And, um, and next month, just a reminder that um, uh, Yellow Wife is our book club pick for, for the next month for May, and the author will be joining us. And then in June, it's The Gunkle, and Stephen Rowley will, will be joining us. So it was so exciting to meet all these really spectacular authors. I just love it. So thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening, everybody. And thank you for joining us, um, Nita Prose. Thank you so much, Shelly. And thank you to everyone in the Girlfriend Book Club. It's a real honor to be here. Thank you, guys. Everybody.